My guest today is a British author, researcher and public speaker. He's a former club and radio DJ and for the past 12 years he's been exposing the true nature of the music industry and the agenda it's really being used to push. He's coming to Australia in just two weeks and I'm very much looking forward to meeting him. Mark Devlin, thank you so much for joining me on the 8 News Show. No worries, Andrew. Happy to be here. Uh, so I can hear your phone going off in the background there. I'm glad it's not me. Um, mate, um, thank you again. You're coming out to Australia. Uh, I believe you're going to be here um, on the 1st of November. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I'm leaving the UK on the 30th of October. It takes forever to get there, as you probably yes. know. So yeah. uh, the first gig I'll be doing is in Melbourne on the 1st of November. Uh, then it's a very quick trip. I'm then hopping over to Brisbane to do my gig there on the 2nd. Then I've actually allowed myself a day off on the Friday uh, just to catch up and chill and relax mm -hmm. then on saturday i'm going to be in sydney that's saturday 4th of november and then sunday the 5th over to perth and that's the last gig and then i'm heading back home so the whole trip is within a week right mate um can i start by asking you what was it that happened in your life that caused you to start questioning the true nature of things it was a gradual process with me. It wasn't a single moment of epiphany, which many other people have. It started round about 2007. And at that point, I'd started to have some big questions about what was really going on in the world, who was really running things, specifically why there was so much injustice, why there was always war, why there was always conflict, why mm. there was always pain and suffering. I just wanted to know why that is, because it didn't seem to me to be a natural state of human affairs. And my dad actually put me onto the books of David Icke at that time mm. and encouraged me to read them. And at that time, I had the same view of David Icke as most people in Britain did. I thought that the poor man had lost his mind. He'd undergone some sort of mental breakdown. But my dad said, well, just read what he says and see if it makes sense to you. So mm -hmm. I did. And I found that it answered so many of the questions I'd had up to that point. So... The world is full of pain, injustice, suffering, death and war because it's set up to be that way mm. by those parties that really run the world. And it's not governments. It's not prime ministers and presidents. I came to realize that there's a power structure which lies above these individuals in the pyramid of power, if you like, and mm -hmm. they are the ones that are calling the shots, and they are the ones that are directing daily human affairs, and they've been mm -hmm. doing it for a very long time. And I specifically wanted to know how this plays out into my area of interest, the music industry, because I'd heard whisperings that the music industry is used to push social engineering agendas and mind control and is putting a cult subliminal symbolism into the minds of the public and i just wanted to really get a grasp on that subject mm. and comprehend it better so i threw myself into that type of research around about 2010 that's when it all started and it culminated in the publication of my first musical truth book in early 2016 which by that point was based on about five years worth of research mm. and since then it's become my life it's become my full-time job yeah, uh, I guess we, we need to mention due to the timing of, of what's going on in the world right now that uh, I think, especially since the pandemic, a lot of people have their eyes open to what's going on in um, Israel with um, Israel and the Palestinians. Um, interesting timing, isn't it, that uh, we... we we're all waiting and expecting for another attack. And I don't mean necessarily a war. With all the things that are lined up in the world right now, um, the digital, the central bank digital currency um, looming, further looming uh, pandemics, um, smart cities programming, 
all these things, we're all sort of waiting, watching, listening. And now, out of the blue, there's this monumental um, attack that's been um, t- that's taken place over there in the Middle East. And uh, gosh, uh, I, I, I know just from watching the mainstream media that there are a lot of people that aren't quite aware of what you're talking about, but I know that many, many are, and there are many more joining the ranks um, every day. So um, I can't wait to... Um, you know, see what comes out of this, as horrific as, as it is. Uh, I think that um, there are going to be many more people wanting to join your audience when you're out here in Australia, I'm, I'm sure of that. So, look, um, you know, I've watched a lot of your material. It's very interesting. Um, it's being the fact that it's centred around the music industry. It's not something that I've... Um, been previously aware of. However, uh, I, I'm very aware of what the, it goes on in the movie industry. They're constantly showing us what they're planning to do. And, I mean, for anyone who's watching this thinking, oh, you conspiracy theorist, um, let me say that once your eyes have um, learnt to see, you cannot unsee and, you know, everywhere I look, every time I turn on the television, there's some kind of programming coming straight out of it. And it's just so blatantly obvious. Um, in in the material that you put out, and in fact, something that you put out just recently, you speak about sound being used as a weapon. Uh, I think that my audience would be very aware of that since the pandemic and the deployment of the LRAD technology that that the police uh, deployed in many parts of Australia um, during that time. What what can you add about it? Add sorry. What can you add to that? Because um, it gets far more into the esoteric, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And the music industry stuff and sound and how sound can be weaponized is an aspect of things that people often miss. So you'll get people who accept that politics is not what it seems, that politicians are controlled. They're effectively puppets. They realize that the world of science and medicine and academia is compromised. They realize that the mainstream media is lying to us all the time. Mm. They might even realize that Hollywood movies are used for subliminal programming and pushing of agendas, but they might not accept that that sort of thing goes on in the music industry. So I've had this conversation with many people. They seem to think that somehow these big bands and these big musicians have just flown under the radar and they've achieved that level of success and prominence Mm. entirely under their own steam without any assistance from other parties. Mm. And it becomes clear when you take a holistic viewpoint of the world that that could never happen. No industry could ever be allowed to thrive on its own without being completely controlled and corrupted. And, of course, that's what's happened. And I've presented multiple evidence for this over the past getting on for 15 years. Mm. And sure, an aspect of that is sound itself in recognition of the fact that this reality, this realm in which we find ourselves is comprised of sound and light energy vibrating at an endless array of different frequencies. There's a famous quote by Nikola Tesla, which many will be familiar with, where he says, if you want to understand the universe, think in terms of energy frequency and vibration. And that really is the key to it. And so those nefarious forces, which unfortunately control the corporate music industry, have developed ways of using sound frequencies as weapons against us. And the ingenious thing from their point of view is that this happens on an unseen level. So you can have things embedded into recordings 
or even happening with live music as it's being played, which your conscious mind is not aware of, but mm. it could still be having an effect on you. So I have touched on that in a presentation, which I put out recently, and I've also mentioned it in my books. I think specifically Musical Truth Volume 2 goes into that. But it's a very key part of things in terms of uh, how all that stuff can be weaponized mm. and unfortunate. Yes, yeah. Um, Mark, what other kinds of uh, topics can your audience look forward to hearing about in your events? So I talk about mind control and how that plays out in the music industry. And those are connections that people might not necessarily make at first. Uh, I've got a separate presentation called Music's Military and Mind Control Connections, because so often where you find systematic mind control of the type that came out of the CIA's MK Ultra program and its many mm. derivatives, you find connections to the worlds of military intelligence, which is a bit of an oxymoron, uh, never far from the surface. And unfortunately, where you find that, you often find a cult ritual, dark occult, satanic practices, and you also get into the ugly world of pedophilia. Mm. All of these things are connected. All of them play into the controlled corporate music industry. Again, people are horrified to hear those connections made. Mm. And at first, they would probably not accept it. But all the evidence is there. So I tie all that together. I do go in a lot on mind control, how many famous, well-known household name artists will have been subject to trauma-based mind control and also satanic ritual abuse to program their minds for a life of performance and servitude to their overlords. Mm. And also how symbolism pertaining to this is routinely embedded in music videos, live stage shows, record sleeves, this sort of thing. Yeah. Plenty of examples of that will be offered. I'll be talking about how very well-known groups, and I often hone in on the Beatles and the Rolling Stones as two great examples of this dynamic, will have been products of social engineering operations, such as Tavistock, the Tavistock Institute in London. Yeah. And I am going to be going in on a few Australian artists, just to keep it topical for an Australian audience. So I'm currently looking into some aspects of Nick Cave, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. Mm -hmm. I'm looking into Sia, the singer, Sia Furler. There's some interesting stuff there. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got some stuff on Kylie Minogue. I'm going to be going in on Michael Hutchins and the strange circumstances behind his death in 1997. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned yeah, yeah, to Bob Geldof and Paula Yates. Yeah. Uh, that's a very dark and murky story. I've got lots on that. And um, a few other Australian artists, Rolf Harris, probably have to mention him. Yeah, yeah. Keep it Look, interesting, you know. I'm glad you mentioned Michael Hutchins because that was one of the questions I had for you. Um, I think everyone wants to know more about that. Um, sure. Can I ask you, uh, from a selfish point of view, I was a huge fan of Nirvana when I was young, uh, when I was a younger guy. Uh, what is there? There's some very strange circumstances around that. Have you ever done any research on that, on the death of Kurt Cobain? I've touched on the surface of it. I've not done a deep dive into Nirvana and Cobain. The mm -hmm. obvious thing about him is that he's a member of the so-called 27 Club which is this large number of musicians who turn up dead at the age of 27 mm. in some strange, bizarre circumstance or other. Mm. And when you look at the details surrounding it, there's always discrepancies and anomalies and strange things going on. Uh, many researchers seem to think that Courtney Love, his partner or wife, was involved in his death. Mm. And that claim has actually come from Hank Harrison, who was a former CIA operative. He was active in the 1960s, in the formative years of the Grateful Dead. He worked as a road manager for that group. He also turns out to be the biological father of Courtney Love. And he himself 
made statements pertaining to his belief that she had something to do with the death of Kurt well, Cobain. There's a really interesting documentary, and I'm really ashamed of myself for not looking that up before. But now that you say that, I did see the documentary that was made where he soaked in bleach. That one. It could have been. It was a very it came out obviously a very long time ago, twenty five years ago. Um, I do remember him being the one that was making that claim, and to right. hear that he was a member of the CIA is just, I mean, surprise, surprise, right? Pretty crazy, right? I mean, there's connection yeah. for days. Another road manager for the Grateful Dead, who was also their music publisher, was a guy named Alan Trist. And he turns out to be the son of one of the founding members of the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations in London, mm. uh, Eric Trist. Uh -huh. So why should there be a connection between this stoned out hippie sort of band who were the poster children for that counterculture flower power scene in mm. America, pushing LSD and uh, this kind of culture yeah. and Tavistock in London, which specializes in social engineering psyops. That's just one of so many connections. They just go on for days. I've filled three books with them. I could probably carry on writing these books for the rest of my life, however long I've got left and never run out of material. You know, it's a subject which I think has been very underreported over the years. And I seem to have just stumbled into this job and filled this vacancy for some reason. Yeah. Um, okay, Mark, um, your tour kicks off in just two weeks time. I'm going to put the dates up on screen right now for the audience. Um, if you are interested in seeing Mark's um, presentation, please pause the video now and uh, write down the details or look in the description below. I'm going to put your website, Mark, in the description. So, um, I'm hoping everyone will jump on and book a ticket immediately. Can't wait to see your show. Uh, is there anything else that you would particularly like to point out to the audience before we wrap this up? I think it's great that so many people are now paying attention to what's really happening in the world as a result of what we've all been through these past three and a half years. And it seems a very topical time for me to be visiting Australia. Mm. So I know your nation has been absolutely hammered with the tyranny uh, since early 2020. I know it's been really bad there. It's very mm. interesting for me to keep an eye on the ticket booking figures for the four gigs, because right now, Melbourne is way out in front. And mm -hmm. I think there's a reason for that, because Melbourne got it really bad under absolutely. Dan Andrews. You know? And it's obvious that so many people have woken up, to use that phrase, and are now paying attention to what's happening as a result of what's been done to us. So there would have been some collateral damage factored into the agenda that was unrolled. You know, the architects of it would have known that some people are going to be woken up by just how obvious and blatant the tyranny has been these mm. past few years. But I think they would have underestimated the extent to which so many people are now on board, Look, standing on the right side of history. Yeah. It's a spiritual battle. Many of us understand this. It really is literally good versus evil. Whatever yeah. your religious beliefs may be, it's very clear that's what's playing out. History is watching. We are making history. And it feels a very good time for me to be presenting my information to these audiences. So I was supposed to come out in March 2020 with expert timing. I'd picked the very week that Australia got plunged into lockdown. Mm -hmm. So I've waited three and a half years to come back and do this tour. And during that time, I've received a lot of correspondence from people in Australia saying they've discovered my work and asking me questions about it. So I'm really looking forward to engaging with uh, Australian audiences. I'll be doing Q&As at the end of each event. So if people have got questions or comments, then we'll make room for that. 
I'm just looking forward to networking with people and yeah. meeting like-minded people. Uh, I've been doing that all over the UK, but I've not really travelled much since 2020 for obvious reasons. So it's going to be great to be back. You know, the last time I was in Australia was 2009. Uh, I guess it's changed a fair bit since then, but uh, just looking forward to being back on Aussie shores, man. I love it out there. Mate, uh, I think you've nailed it in what you just said. I, I believe that... Um, I mean, especially since this pandemic era, we all are aware now of the of synchronicity and the timing of things. And there's always a reason why. And the fact that you didn't get here in March of 2020 is an absolute blessing in disguise. I'm absolutely certain of that. And also, uh, you mentioned earlier the, the topic of pedophilia in the ranks of you know, it's not just the music industry. It's in all, it's all over the place. And I'm certain that you'll find when you get here that your audience is very receptive to those claims. Um, it's a hot topic over here. Uh, in anywhere you go, um, something you might want to look up is the uh, person by the name of Fiona Barnett. Don't know oh, if yeah. you've heard of her and her yeah, links too. to families like the Kidman family, Nicole Kidman. Um, yes. Very interesting. Uh, her father was an MK Ultra doctor. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, Dr. I, yeah. And look, you know, look, I watched um, just about everything that she put out. And um, I've got to tell you, just out of interest, I also recently watched the Viking series. Now, that's been out for many years now, and I'd never watched it before, but there were scenes in that that were so horrific that I was sitting on the lounge watching it thinking, why am I watching this? And then just a couple of weeks later, out of nowhere, I learnt about Fiona Barnett, started watching all the material she was putting out, and found that lots of the things that she was talking about was actually symbolised in that TV series. Fascinating, isn't it? They're always showing us what they want to do, but they but it's always hidden in plain sight, as they say. So, well, I think that you'll find your audience is really going to be um, impressed with your presentation. They're going to enjoy it very much. I know I will. Um, so with that, uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining me um, today. I really appreciate it. And uh, for the audience, please, whatever you do, like, share and subscribe. Uh, put this video out as far and as wide as you can. Uh, this will go up on Facebook. Uh, let's hope it doesn't get blocked, but um, I'm certain that it won't. Um, let's get that one out there and let's uh, fill the seats sell all and get these tickets sold because uh, this one is going to be a feather in your cap for the future. It's all part of the bigger picture, isn't it, Mark? Right. Yeah, thanks, brother. Uh, just to say that each event holds around 100 people, so it's going to mm -hmm. be similarly sized events in each city. The Melbourne one is currently showing about 70 ticket bookings, so there's only about 30 places left there. Uh, the other shows have a bit more room still for tickets. Um, but, yeah, let's try and get a full house in each one. It would be great to uh, get as many people as possible out hearing this information and I uh, just want to interact with them. And uh, it's a great opportunity. This doesn't happen too often.